in a few narrations attributed to him. One, he says that there are ayat in the Quran, uh, 30 ayat in the Quran. Whoever recites them is going to be prevented and protected, inshallah, from the punishment of the grave. And this goes to show you that the early companions understood that the punishment of the grave is real. It is not metaphoric. It's not just a few images that we just think about to reflect on being better in this world, that it is actually real. The punishment of the grave is a literal punishment. And there's another hadith attributed also to Ibn Mas'ud in Al-Mustadrak and others. Uh, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi says that there is a, um, an individual who's going to be placed in the, uh, in the grave. And when they're placed in the grave, subhanAllah, or even in Jahannam, there's different narrations, the fire would try to come or the punishment would try to come towards the face and the face would basically say that, no, I have been protected by this surah, surah al-mulk. And then the fire would approach or the punishment would approach the body, the chest, and the chest would say, I am also protected by surah al-mulk. And then the same thing with the body, the legs, the limbs, the arms, every part of the body would profess, I am protected by surah al-mulk. And that is why the companions themselves used to memorize the surah at a young age, and they used to basically finish their night, many of them would finish their night by reading the surah. So it's important, inshallah, to um, read the surah every single night. You know, subhanallah, one thing that you should do with your children is this should become their lullaby. This should become their nighttime routine. The last thing that they should hear after they hear a story or they hear something and they update you about the day or the night, the last thing that they should hear from your mouth before you say salam to them and hug them and let them go to sleep should be the surah, surah al-mulk. And of course, it is important to not only memorize, but to reflect on and to understand as well. And that's why in some, in some uh, communities, I'm, I'm not sure if it's all of Leb Lebanon, but when I was uh, in Lebanon and Beirut and others, and many of the Lebanese shiuch that I know, for Isha specifically, they recite surah al-mulk, so the community gets used to it. And I know a sheikh who's been doing it for 35 years, and after the 35 years, the community began to complain, sheikh, every single night, Isha, mulk, 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 yani, it's the only surah that you know. So, uh, yani, the, you know, the community, mashallah, has a way of uh, voicing their, uh, you know, criticism. Alhamdulillah. But it goes back to say and to show that this is an important surah that we need to um, recite before we go to sleep every single night. And it is a protection from the grave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the beginning, Tabarak al-ladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Al-baraka, he is ziyadatu fil khayr. Barakah is to increase the good. So every one of us has a, an internal capacity and a potential and a propensity towards good. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is able to increase that good. Exponentially bring about goodness out of anything and exponentially allow the potential for goodness to grow in anything. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beginning this surah by reminding us it is He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is by Himself, in Himself, in his essence, a source of increase in goodness, and that goodness is increasing on its own. You know, sometimes there is good, but it needs something else. Like you can have a light, but it needs oil to keep glowing, or electricity, or some form of energy to keep glowing. But then there's something which is intrinsic by itself. It continues to increase on its own. It's intrinsic, and it doesn't need anything else. That's the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't need a cause. It doesn't need a precondition. It doesn't need a precursor. It's on its own, existing autonomously, independently, as a source of good that increases goodness in everything else and brings goodness out of everything else. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, الذي بيده الملك This blessing, this ability to bring good, is given and attributed only to the one whose, whose hands contain and possess all of the kingdom, all of the authority all of the power, all of the dominion, which is a reminder, subhanAllah, especially in the world that we're living in today, you know, sometimes it's easy to, yani Allah reminds us in the Quran, حَتَّى إِذَا أَخَذَتْ الْأَرْضِ زُخْرُفَهَا وَزَّيَّنَتْ وَظَنَّ أَهْلُهَا أَنَّهُمْ قَادِرُونَ عَلَيْهَا There's going to come a time in which the world becomes so decorative, the world becomes so beautiful, so artificially attractive, that it seems it gives the false impression that we've finally made it. Everything is automated. Everything has been so easy. Everything is so, uh, again, uh, efficient. Everything is at its peak. You're doing almost nothing. And, you know, automatic wealth is generating. 
So you get a sense that we've made it. We've finally been able to kind of crack the code. Finally, we've been able to get to the height of possession and control over this world. And Allah reminds us, it's actually when you get to that level that the carpet of comfort and the carpet of control is taking from underneath you because remember that you're never fully in control. You're never fully in control. So Allah is already reminded us in, in reminding us in the Quran that we're going to get to a point in our control and capacity to interact with this world where we're, we, we give ourselves the impression that we're fully, fully in control. But Allah is reminding us that He is the source of control and it is through Him that all control is possible. Now this is important. Why? Because it's a reminder again in the Quran that all the khair is within the dominion and the control of Allah. There's no good that can happen except through Allah. Whether it's good in your health, good in your wealth, good in your relationship, good in your marriage, good in your memory, good in your whatever it may be, physical, metaphysical, any kind of good is only possible through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the source of all good, the source of all good. And it's easy again to give yourself the impression that yes, this world is just based on cause and effect. I plant the seed, the seed grows. I can water the seed. There are some conditions as long as I meet them, I'll, you know, things will work out. Things will basically happen. But even if they're happening somewhat, it may seem independently, nothing is independent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah interferes in every process. Allah interjects in every reaction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is involved in every outcome. So remember that. And then Allah says, وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ it is he who is over all things capable. It is he who is over all things capable. And this is important because sometimes we may attribute incapacity to ourselves. And that limits our capacity to actualize and realize specific goals or achieve specific goals. But when you begin to understand your limitation and your incapacity, and then you begin to lean on the capacity and the power of Allah, that is when you're able to achieve many, many things that you otherwise would not have been able to achieve and there are many examples of this you know just a few weeks ago we were talking to mashallah to barakallah um, a, a very very uh, respected sister in our community and she's an ustada a teacher a, a, in many many ways mashallah she holds uh, a lot of respectful and a lot of contributing um, mashallah uh, roles within the community and then she was talking about how she was so busy for many many years that there was the goal of memorizing the Qur'an in all of its 10 dialectical recitations, 10 modes of recitations. And then that seemed to be such a far goal. You know, you're busy, you're hustling, especially in this modern day. And you've already passed, you know, you're past your 40s or your 30s. You feel like khalas, yeah, or even your 50s sometimes. And you feel like, what's, yeah, I'm really going to start memorizing the Qur'an at 50? I'm really going to start learning the interpretation and the modes of the Qur'an at 50? I mean, my memory is already failing. This is a near impossible task. But she says, I would just look at the busy schedule that I have and every single night that I wasn't able to start yet, I would make the dua every single night consistently. For years, this went on for many, many, many years until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened up the doors. And suddenly it was just a matter of scheduling and consistency and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it possible. And I'm sure there are many goals in your life now where you're thinking to yourself, could this really be possible? Can I really start now? Isn't it too late? It may be a specific spiritual goal, an Islamic goal, an educational goal, a physical goal, a financial goal, whatever it may be, just know that all goals are attainable through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you put in the effort towards a specific goal, Allah's capacity is kun fayakun, be and it is. We need to remember that. Everything is possible, everything is possible through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah then says, Alladhi khalaq al wal hayata. It is you created maut and haya. Now what's interesting subhanAllah because you see the translation here it actually reverses them. But here the the, 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 the original Quranic ayah itself says it is you created death and life. Now if you think about it death and life are processes. They're not entities in themselves. Like death is not something that is you know you can contain materially. Neither is life. Even the soul, the source of life, right? It's, 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 it's the fusion, the energy of life, the source of life. But life itself is not something that is tangible. It's, it's something that is experienced. It is a state of being, not an entity in its own. But Allah is reminding us here that not only does He create the entities, 
but he creates also the processes through which entities manifest. The process through which entities manifest. And he reminds us in this surah, irrigation, the earth, the stars, the orbits, every process that we take as a for granted, it just happens, it is there, is not a process that has come on its own, it is a creation of Allah. It is a direct result of Allah's kun fayakun. Now you go back and you think, why does Allah begin with death, not life? Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ As processes, you would think that life would come first and then followed, you would see death. But Allah actually reverses them. Is he created death and he also created life. Because what's actually the default? We say the default is life. But what were you before you were alive? You were non-existent. That's a, that's a form of death. And what happens after you're alive? You die. But what's the ultimate? What's the ultimate? Uh, what's the ultimate goal, or the ultimate uh, uh, target? The ultimate target is life, eternal life. So actually, we come from non-existence, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one that gives us existence, and that's why He begins by saying, among many reasons, of course, by saying that it is He who created the process of death, and it is He who created the process of life. And sometimes what happens, subhanAllah, is, you know, we, we, we kind of forget, forget. You know, when you're, when you, how many people do you see when they're trying to conceive and have a baby and, and, and start a family? How many of the human population, people on earth, actually consistently invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And how many of them just see it as a biological entity? It, just, it just happens. It's part of procreation. It's part of life. It just is. And, and no death also. It just happens. Right? But there's no philosophical involvement or understanding. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us that non-existence in itself is a state that Allah has made possible. And life in itself is a state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made possible. Why did he create life and death and these processes and the situation of going from non-existence to existence? لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ is to basically unveil, truly show, which one of you to test, to reveal, which one of you is ahsan amala, ahsan amala, is better, has higher quality of actions, of deeds. Now it shows you here, it's not about quantity only, it's about quality. Ahsan amala, which one of you has higher quality in action. And that shows you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is judging what? Judging, yes, our intention, but also judging the quality of our action. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to say, blessed is the person who had a long life and was able to use the time that they had to also produce good work, high quality work. So when Allah gives you a long life and you're able to use it for good, to do good in this world, that's the best. And then he also said, horrible is the one who has a short life and also a short or less quality in action. And also horrible is the one who's been given long life but use that long life to produce and to create wrong and evil instead of good. And it is he who is the Almighty and the most forgiving. When does the Izzah manifest? The Izzah, the might of Allah, manifests when somebody breaks the code and what Allah has legislated. That's when Allah manifests his Izzah. And the Maghfirah, the forgiveness, is manifested when someone does their best, but on our own will never be able to Attain the maghfirah of Allah. Remember the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says, or attain the grace of Allah. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to Aisha, O oh Aisha, none of us enter Jannah through our deeds. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, not even you. He said, not even me, except that Allah would shower me with his forgiveness. Would shower me with his forgiveness. And you know, sometimes, subhanAllah, you have, you know, people would say, isn't that such a pessimistic position to be? You, in your own Islam, you can't even guarantee your own salvation. Whereas we, or some other traditions, they say, salvation is guaranteed, mathalan, through Christ, or guaranteed through this, or guaranteed through that. And we say that salvation is guaranteed by connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, categorically. But none of us can guarantee that to ourselves individually, out of humility, out of adab, out of etiquette with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not like if you do X, Y, and Z, you come to Allah and Allah is like, ah, oh, today I feel like I'm not going to give you Jannah. 
it depends on how if you were billah like Allah is above any you know of this nonsense that is attributed to him wrongfully right what it means it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's judgment and decision at the end of the day and we do the best that we can not relying or leaning on our actions alone but relying and leaning on the immense forgiveness and capacity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about life and death as processes and the creation and his interjection and intervention also as a process he brings our attention to some of the most beautiful things that he's created and what does he say he says khalaqa sab'a samawatin tibaqa it is he who created seven layers tibaqa tabaqa right tabaqan an tabaq layer upon layer seven layers seven stratas right seven strata of what of heavens sama means above so seven layers of what is above you seven layers of what is above you now everything according to the hadith everything that can be seen that can be seen with the human eye and with the aid that humanity would eventually get is limited within the first layer so in modern language what this means is the observable universe with all of its capacity and expansions and layers and everything that's contained within it, the OB, the observable, uh, the OU, the observable universe, all of that is, is, is within the first layer of heaven. Can you imagine? So even within the first layer, there are things that are expanding beyond our capacity to reach. Because the universe is expanding, right? As Allah reminds us in the Quran as well, right? Uh, that we have allowed the universe to continue to expand. وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ right? وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَيْنَاهَا بِأَيْدٍ The heavens we created, we constructed with our own interjection, with our own hand, with Allah's own hand. وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ And we've made it to continue to expand. So even the first sama, Allah says the, the sama, that we're talking about the sama at dunya, the lower sama, the lower heaven. Allah constructed it with His own intervention. Right? Allah's reminding you here. There's intervention. بِأَيْدٍ بِأَيْدٍ why does Allah say be aidin with our own interjection? Because some people say, oh yeah, it just it just happened to be. It just existed out of like a big bang. It just happened to be. It's stardust, it's remnants, and all of these, you know, explanations that attribute some form of autonomy. Allah says, no, be aidin. There's a direct hand of God that is involved. And it couldn't get clearer. And it's amazing that it's explicitly specific about this, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us here. It is he who created these seven layers of heaven. You will never see any tafawut, any discrepancy, any unintentionality, any imperfection in the creation of Allah. You will never see any imperfection in the creation of Allah. Look, look again. So Allah is saying, look, look again, look. Look again. Do you see any flaws? Now what's amazing here is Allah says, it is you created everything with purpose, with intentionality, with some form of synchrony. Sometimes what happens is our eyes perceive imperfection. Our eyes perceive imperfection. So Allah is reminding us, when you see the imperfection, what do you do? Look again. Allah says, Farj al Basara. Oh, but I see this imperfection here. Farj al Basara. Look again. Look again. You will see that what you assume to be imperfect is actually perfect in many, many ways. You know, think about the things that we sometimes uh, assume from a disability studies point of view. Oh, this person is disabled. Allah is saying, Look again. You see it as disability, unintentionality. Allah sees it as what? As ability. Oh, you have a, a child who's handicapped Allah says look again you will come to realize that is not actually a limitation but in many many ways an expression of Allah's power an expression of Allah's creative capacity look again look again so Allah is reminding us to look at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right whatever is within and around us to see it as something that is intended something that has the creative capacity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala min futur then Allah says then look again and again. Imagine that's three times. Allah says, look again. When you assume imperfection, 
Then look again and look again. In places where you assume imperfection and in places where you see the beauty and the grace, look again and look again. You know, when you read the tafsir of, um, you know, especially modern tafsir, I remember one of the mufassirun, he says, it's like when you go with your uh, family and you're trying to buy a house. So you take the first look, you like the house. So what do you do? You say to the miskeen uh, real estate agent, we want to see it again. Okay, miskeen real estate agent goes with you and then he shows you the house again. And then you see it and you come back and two days later, like, I want to see it again. Okay, fine, I'll take you one more time. Miskeen is doing 20 of these and only maybe one out of like 50 is going to you know, fall through and then the rest of you are like, mashallah, this real estate agent is making $50,000 off of every house. You're giving him another ayn and Miskeen is not even able to pay the bills. Nonetheless, I mean, you know, especially in, in, in Ontario now, where every family has like four real estate agents, right? In any case, may Allah make it easy for everybody. So you look again, you look again, you look again, you look again. Why? Because when you're impressed by something or you like it, you want to you wanna see it again, you want to see it again, you want to see it again, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, when it comes to the universe, when it comes to the creation of Allah, look, 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 keep looking. And you know, subhanAllah, uh, yesterday we were talking about Ibn al-Qayyim and what Ibn al-Qayyim says in his uh, Da'an al-Dawa, the book, The Disease and the Cure. He says, everything begins with a look. Everything begins with a look. The look eventually imprints an image, right? Al-Khatira, tatba'uha al-Fikra, right? The, uh, the, 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 the image or the, the, the look imprints an image in your mind. And the image eventually creates a thought, a pattern. And the pattern eventually creates a desire. And the desire eventually creates a will. And the will eventually creates a determination or an orientation. And the determination or the orientation eventually creates or leads to an action. Now these are the words of someone who's writing many, many centuries ago. But he's talking, subhanAllah, about the impact of looking. Now that is in the haram and also in the halal. An example that I give in the children's halaqa, imagine you find a cake and this cake is haram. It's not halal. So if you find that it's not halal, what do you do? You let it be. You don't, you don't keep looking. But what happens after you keep looking, you keep looking, you keep looking, you keep looking. You're going to start to notice the layers. You're going to start to notice that, mashallah, that the red on top. You're going to try, mashallah. And you're like, wow. That, 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 you know? And eventually what happens, it becomes an image. Every time you close your eyes, what do you see? You see the cake. You close your eyes, what do you see? The cake. And then what eventually happens, it creates in you the desire. I want cake, I want cake, I love cake, 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 cake. Then it becomes a determination. I must eat the cake, I must eat the cake. I, you know, And then it becomes an orientation. The only thing I see is cake forever. Like, brother, there's lots of other cake. No, I want that cake, 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 this one, right? And then eventually what happens? You eat the cake. You eat the cake. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us to look away when it's haram. But when it's beautiful and halal, and good, what is Allah reminding us? To look. To look. So to look at the stars. Right? To look at the moon. To look at the layers. To just look up. To think. To reflect on this. And I ask you, when was the last time you just walked out to a beautiful clear sky and you just looked up? You know, our ancient you know, uh, civilizations, they used to do that every single night. I guarantee you, there are some of you here that have not looked up in months. Right, you're looking down on your phone like, oh, this is a nice picture of the sky. I love it. So nice. Like the sky is there, Habib. Well, I love these, uh, you know, <laughs> subhanAllah. It's such, a, it's such an interesting time that we're living in, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, look and look at the halal. And what's amazing here is some of the scholars in commentary, they say, building on this ayah, that Allah is encouraging you to look at all that is lawful. So he's encouraging you to, to, to suspend, to put everything else aside and to look at your children, to just look at them, to take in the beauty of your children, to look at your wife, to look at your husband, to take in the beauty of your children, uh, the beauty of your husband, the beauty of your wife, right? The grace, Allah's beautiful power that he manifests. Again, some of you, maybe you're so busy hustling and bustling, you haven't actually sat down to look at your partner, to look at your wife and to look at your husband and to appreciate the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, it was known about him that when he would be with you, he would give you his full face. He would give you his full attention. He would not look at anything else. And some of the companions, of course, um, this is again some of the intimate, intimate, subhanAllah, yani details that you learn by being immersed, right? But I remember, subhanAllah, yani within family members, 
seeing, mashallah, tabarakallah, the love and the expression of appreciation, that really goes a long way. And if you don't see that love manifested, it becomes difficult to embody it, right? Like for example, how many of you imagine your, your husband has like, uh, what are they called? Hasanat in English, like the moles or the skin marks. How many of you like count the skin marks on your husband's face, your wife's face? You say beautiful things like these are stars. They remind me of the heavens. Uh, some of you look at A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan, right? So these, these are, again, and the scholars would allude to this without getting intimate because, again, it's pri there's a privacy that is maintained. But Allah is reminding us to appreciate the good, to appreciate the halal because once you do that, it satiates you. It satiates you. It fills that desire for beauty and grace and it allows you to feel uh, at ease, at peace and does not create or allow for room for shaitan to enter and allow for cravings to be misused or to be misplaced or to be misdirected. It's very important. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you keep looking and looking again, you will come to realize if you're looking for imperfections in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power, in Allah's creation, uh, Allah says, uh, يَنْقَلِبْ Your sight will return back to you and you will be frustrated and wary. That if you're trying to look for imperfections, and you keep looking and looking and looking and analyzing, eventually you will come to realize out of frustration and awareness that there is no imperfection in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah 5, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَا صَابِيحَ وَجَعَنَّاهَا رُجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ وَأَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابِ السَّعِيرِ Allah mentions in the Quran three functions of the nujum. The nujum. By the way, what does the word najm mean? Najm means what? Najma, a star, yeah. But actually, najm means to appear. Najm means to appear. So anything that's that's appearing is called a, a najm, or anything that appears, uh, appears and disappears, comes and goes, is actually called the najm because it appears temporarily and then it might go. Now, it's interesting because the Arabs, the Arabs actually use the word najm. They use the word najm to refer to the little. You know how some trees grow to be very big and they have like a trunk? But then some plants, they grow a little bit and then they disappear. They grow a little bit and then they disappear. They grow a little bit and disappear, like fruits, vegetables. They grow a little bit and then disappear. All of these things are called nujum, nujum, nujum. It doesn't just refer to the things that appear and, and disappear up there. It refers to the things that appear and disappear down there as well. And that's why, subhanAllah, when you sometimes look at, um, you know, uh, cucumbers, or uh, carrots, and you see that the Arabs classified these as Najum, and you're like, what? These are not stars. How are these called Najum? And then it goes back to actually the etymology of the word. Very important to understand the Arabic language and how it functions. Uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there are three functions or three, um, three ways that the stars can be perceived in the Quran. Here we hear two of them. Allah says, We've made the lower heaven the observable universe decorated with all kinds of stars. All kinds of stars. So it's a decoration. A decoration. And we made some of it sometimes to be a form of flame that is pushed to and stones or like a missile that is launched at the eavesdroppers. Now there's a lot to unpack here. The third function of the Najum, the stars, what do the Najum do? The Najum also, جعلنا, uh, Allah says, we made the, the stars a source of guidance for people who are traveling. So when you're navigating at night in the darkness, you're actually able to use وعلامات وبالنجمي هم يهتدون وعلامات, they become signs, signs. And it is through the stars that they find their way. It's through the stars that they find their way. Now, what's interesting, some people actually use this to justify like horoscopes and starology and all this stuff, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that very clear that this is actually not what's meant here. It's meant as a physical form of guidance. You can actually find your way at night. Right, let's unpack a few things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the stars serve as decoration. Now, the question is decoration for who? Manifestation of the power, the creation, the beauty of Allah. Who's observing this? The human being. So it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed, because Allah could have allowed all this stuff 
to not really reach the light of the stars, to not really reach the earth. But Allah has allowed the light of the stars to reach the earth, right? To become a source of beauty. Like Allah has allowed fireworks to, to exist. You just look up. That's a, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created such beauty for you to observe, what does that say about the love that Allah has for you? What does that say about the, the, the honor that is attributed to the human being? And not only do I create a world for you, but I create a beautiful world for you. A beautiful world, if you look around, like if, when, you, when you go scuba diving and you see the creation in the ocean, you're like, wow, mashallah. And when you go into like for space exploration, you can't really afford it, I understand. But you can see it through like, uh, you know, telescopes and through people who've been and through pictures and, and others and, and, and designs and, and modules. It's amazing. It, you're just induced. You're in awe. And it's amazing, subhanAllah, that some people who have not been able to understand and have a taste of iman, they see this stuff as the result of randomness. It's just random. It just is. But Allah is reminding us, it is He. I am the one who adorned the lowest heavens with all these lamps, the stars. And it is I, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who made them a missile that strikes the eavesdroppers. The eavesdropper. What is he talking about? So back in the, uh, like before Islam comes, the shayateen, they would actually occupy different positions and they would try to hide, right, within to basically hear the different maqadir or aqdar being written. Remember we mentioned that the daily qadr is written, the weekly qadr is written, the, 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 the yearly qadr is written. And this is written, subhanAllah, and it's conveyed by the angels. So the angels today say, today Abdullah did this, and today Abdullah did that, and this happened, and that happened. Allah willed for this to happen. Like the announcements, the daily, imagine like when you have meetings, and you have your action items, you have your action minutes, this is what happened, this is what is going to happen today. So there's some form of action items and meetings that happen when the angels meet. To discuss the qadr and the manifestation and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that day, for that week, for that month, for that year. And what some of the shayateen, shayateen meaning the jinn who have rebelled, who have broken away, and now they're basically trying to collect information. They would try to collect information to do what? They use this for two things. When you collect information, you're able then to anticipate, to kind of plan, to kind of, you know, try to antagonize. And you can also trade in this information with the people that you're interacting with. So imagine all of these devil worshippers or people who used to have connections with the devil. People used to have connections with the jinn. People used to summon the jinn. All of these things. And then they would say, give me information so I can go back and say, I know this and this and this. And they would mix a lot of right, correct information and then add a lot of incorrect information. And then they would basically use this to kind of uh, bring attention to themselves. The jinn would benefit by, uh, you know, grandizing themselves. They like that attention. And the human being that is in contact with them would basically benefit by providing a service to people as a mystic or as a, uh, as a um, like a kahin, an araf, as a psychic, as some people say. I'm psychic. I can tell you your future. I can read your hand. I can do this. I can do that. Come to me. I'll tell you when you're going to get married. Who are you going to get married? And this and this and that. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, مَنْ أَتَى عَارِفًا أَوْ كَاهِنًا ثُمَّ صَدَّقَ بِهِ فَكَذَّبَ بِمَا نُزِّلَ أَوْ نَزَلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ The one who comes to a psychic where a person who claims to know and knower and listens to them and believes in what they say, it is as if they have disbelieved it. They have denied what was sent upon the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. Now let me ask you this. Why does this get shut? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then sends the angels, and the angels now throw, our, throw kind of missiles to prevent any of the, to prevent any of the um, information coming from above to be heard by the shayateen. Why is that the case during the Prophet's life? What does that happen? Why does that door get shut? And why are the angels now given instruction to not allow that to happen? No longer are the shayateen allowed. They're going to be shot down. Why? What's revealed during the time of the Prophet the, the Quran. Al-Quran. And because it's revealed during the Prophet's life, who is going to be prevented from taking it, misrepresenting it, mispresent? It's the shayateen. So they're going to be prevented from that. So the only channel that comes from above is the channel of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, words being given to Angel Jibreel and then to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that channel gets shut. 
The other one, subhanAllah, the function of the stars that is mentioned in the Quran is alamat. They become like signs. Now what's interesting is because, listen to this guys. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the stars are signs, it means there is a level, there is a level of pattern that can be deduced from studying the stars. How and to the extent to which this pattern can be connected then to the world that we're living in, people differ, the scholars differ, right? But what is, what is a consensus among the scholars is that we don't use the stars as a guidance for our actions when it comes to do and not to do. There's a beautiful story, and this story is actually uh, the story of Mu'tasam. You guys remember the Mu'tasam? The Khalif al-Mu'tasam. And al-Mu'tasam, he was Abbasid, right? Abbasid from the Khulafa of al-Abbasin. And one day he heard the woman who uh, yelled out, Wa Mu'tasimah, Wa Mu'tasimah. Oh Mu'tasam, where are you? Oh Mu'tasam, where are you? Because she was attacked by some of the Byzantinians or by some of the Romans. And she was basically in a position of vulnerability. So she yelled out hundreds, thousands of kilometers away from the Khilafah. From the head of the Khilafah, the Abbasid Khilafah. Where was it? Where was the Abbasid Khilafah? In Baghdad. Right? In Al-Qahira? Iraq, yeah, Baghdad, yeah. Not, not Fustat. Fustat is the Fatimids, right? Uh, the new new Cairo now. The old Cairo and, and new Cairo. So o- old Cairo, actually. Fustat is old Cairo. Now Al-Qahira. You guys know why it's called Al-Qahira, by the way? We'll come back to that. How many of you guys are Egyptian here? Uh, what? A lot of Egyptians. MashaAllah. So... Do you know that, subhanAllah, when, uh, when the Fatimids, when the Fatimids came into Egypt, Dawla al-Fatima, they named Al-Qahira, Cairo, because it was supposed to basically, Qahara means to oppress, to br- like everything else becomes secondary, right? So Cairo was called Qahira because it was supposed to oppress all of the other cities. It was supposed to be the abode of power that no other power could compete with. And it was actually meant to be a, uh, an Ismaili statement against all of Sunni Islam. So it was supposed to be like Shia, uh, like Ismailis are considered to be, yani, uh, again, every, everyone who says La ilaha illallah is a brother of ours, but we have disagreements when it comes to the Quran, if you implement the Quran or not. So the Ismailis themselves are considered by many of the Shias to be kind of like on the outside of Shiism. So here is a group who is Ismaili, who is Shia. And they named the city to oppress, to kind of like stand as a shining star against all of Sunni Islam. And that name persists and stands in history. SubhanAllah. And Al-Azhar, it was called Al-Azhar based on Fatima Zahra because it was supposed to be the most radiant, the most blessed, the most uh, manifest of schools. And it was, a, it was a Shi'i school that was supposed to again produce Shi'ism and allow Shi'ism to manifest uh, across the Sunni world. And it's so interesting, SubhanAllah, that now Al-Azhar is one of the most Again, if not the most prominent Sunni school, and all of this changes when Salah al-Din, of course, enters Egypt, and kind of what he sees to be uh, re, re, uh, refreshment and rejuvenation and kind of reform, bringing back uh, mainstream or normative understanding of Islam to the Egyptian community. A lot of interesting history when you study Egypt, subhanAllah. And when you study the Crusaders and the roles that, you know, the role that the city of Qahira played in being kind of like a, uh, a gateway for the crusaders to, to kind of enter you'll be surprised subhanallah the importance that this city plays again during the crusades both the crusades and the counter crusades subhanallah and also uh, what salah ad mentioned he said if you're able to control jerusalem damascus and cairo you're able to basically unite the muslim world and if you're not able to unite those three cities jerusalem damascus and cairo you will not be able to unite the muslims you will not be able to unite the muslims for the iraqis we'll throw in Baghdad there, inshallah, just so that you're happy. <laughs> anyway, so the reason why I went to Al-Mu'tasam is because Iraq, Baghdad, Baghdad. Yes, like you said, Ahsanti, yes, of course, of course, of course. Baghdad is uh, like, uh, again, Baghdad is the, you know, Ahsanti, is like for clarifying. Baghdad is the hub of civilization, right? The hub of civilization in many ways, even after the sacking. But uh, the reason why we're talking about Al-Mu'tasam, when Al-Mu'tasam was the Khalifa, and this happened, Al-Mu'tasam prepared an army to confront the, uh, the attacks on many Muslim communities in which women were raped, uh, violence took place, 
And Al Mu'tasim said, you know what? I'm going to prepare an army that will bring an end to this injustice. And he wrote out that I'm going to bring an army that starts at my door and ends at yours. That's a huge army. So what happened is these, the, the, um, those who study the stars, those who believe in horoscopes, those who believe in that kind of life, right? Uh, astrology and, st and starology. They said to him, the stars are not aligned. That if you go and attack right now, it will actually be a horrible failure and a horrible defeat and it will be the beginning of the end for the, the entire Muslim community to fall. So he says, really? He says, yeah. Like, when is the worst time to go, according to you guys? They're like, after Fajr, on this day, Tuesday. He says, great. Guess when I'm going to start? After Fajr, on Tuesday. He says, because I believe in Allah, and Allah's will transcends any will. You bring your stars and do as you will. So he set out. He won a massive, like it was a massive victory. And he comes back. And the Sha'ir, subhanAllah, um, you know, his Sha'ir at the time, uh, Abu Tamam, he wrote this beautiful poem. This beautiful poem. And I encourage you all to read this poem. It's a very long poem. Uh, he was the official Sha'ir, uh, the official poet of the, of the state at the time. So he wrote a beautiful, beautiful uh, series of couplets to complement Al Mu'tasim's belief in Allah. And he begins to read you just a few uh, like couplets from the poem. He says, As-Sayfu asdaqu anba'an min al-kutubi fi haddihi al-haddu bayna al-jiddi wal-la'ibi. And then he goes on to say, Wal-ilmu fi shuhubi al-armahi lami'atan bayna al-khamisayni la fi al-sab'ati shuhubi. And then he goes on to say, أين الرواية بل أين النجوم وما صاغوه من زخرف فيها ومن كذب. So basically he says, um, where are the narrators and the orators and the astrologers who kept looking at the stars and they presented all of these decorative words and predictions and prophecies and foretelling and foreshadowing which turned out to be lies. Nothing is true except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. And the book and the sword are the ultimate decider in any decision, not what you say and you predict based on stars. So the book meaning the Quran and the sword meaning actually engaging in physical confrontation, uh, that itself is what it's going to decide, not your beliefs in this and not your beliefs in that. And then of course this was a big subhanAllah yani episode in Islamic history. The Abbasids compliment, uh, commented on this and wrote a lot. And many of the scholars would produce big, big works on reconciling between like acceptable forms of using stars as guidance in the in you know how to use that for patterns for specific weather and weather and things like that, and how to basically prevent and be careful where you draw the lines. And this happens subhanAllah as a legacy during the Abbas time for those of you who are interested. Now coming back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us here again that the stars have been made as a decoration. The stars have been made as a uh, as a um, missile that is to that, that is to basically launched to be launched at the shayateen. And Allah mentions it's not just that they get punished in this dunya; it is also that they get punished in the akhirah. And we have prepared for the shayateen who try to basically collect information, a torment of the blaze. وَلِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ عَذَابُ جَهَنَّمَ وَبِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ. And those who disbelieve in the Lord they too will suffer a severe punishment and what an evil destination that will be. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding, just like there are people that are, that are going to try to collect information, to look into the ghaib, to look into the unseen, to make these predictions, to mix falsehood with truth, you know, try to kind of create some kind of formula just to give you a sense that they know something that you don't know. Allah says those people or the jinn who do that, they receive a severe punishment and the people who engage in that, they receive a severe punishment as well. And then, of course, Subhanallah, when you study, when you study and you see this, yani, uh, you, you hear stories of, uh, you hear stories, Subhanallah, of uh, any crazy stories, crazy stories. Um, there's this uh, Egyptian show, and it's uh, it's one where you come in and you ask for fatwa, and you ask for advice. But I remember this was one episode, and it's interesting to kind of see, you know, get a sense of what's happening on the on the street, like on the, the day the day to day world. So this uh, individual comes and says, uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. 
um, you know, I was uh, I was trying to get married to this guy, and I really, you know, he was my high school crush. Nothing was working. I tried everything possible. So, uh, you know, astaghfirullah, I was so desperate. So I went to the psychic. I paid 10,000 Egyptian pounds, and then the psychic promised that we're going to get married. Alhamdulillah, we got married. Five. May Allah guide you. What's the question? The question is, Sheikh, now we're divorced and he married somebody else. How did you guys get divorced and he married somebody else? Because the lady went to the same psychic and she basically paid him another $10,000. <laughs> so can I pay? the psych I went back to the psychic and I said, can you please undo the first, the first spell and get me to marry him again? He's like, no, the first time is 10000 The second time is 100000 so it's like, Sheikh, out of necessity, because now I have kids with him and this and this and that. I know it's haram, but can I pay the additional 100000 to make sure that we get the relationship back? No, this is haram upon haram upon haram, right? Like this is not, I mean, this is not acceptable. But unfortunately, people believe this. People believe this. Right? And sometimes, you know, sometimes because uh, certain communities uh, in certain countries, without mentioning names, a lot of even people who appear to be religious, people appear to be, to be religious, they will, you know, charge, you know, huge, huge amounts of money to like take a jinn out or to remove a spell, to remove this, to remove that. And unfortunately, again, like the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us we have to kind of like avoid all of that. And those who are sincerely connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or genuinely connected, yes, they can do ruqya, they can read Quran, you can do ruqya on yourself. All of that is acceptable. But be careful of attributing knowledge of the unseen and power of intervention to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that in itself can be a form of shirk, form of association with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is saying most people get to be punished as well because they, this is a form of spiritual abuse, a form of spiritual misuse. So Allah says, تَكَادُ تَمَيَّزُ مِنَ الْغَيْظِ This is such an, like a, a huge and a very, very evocative description of Jahannam. Allah says it's as if Jahannam would burst, would explode, would boil from anger when these individuals are taken into Jahannam. Imagine, Jahannam has a will of its own, feelings of its own, and it boils up out of anger when it sees individuals like this. Every single time a group is cast into it, the keepers of Jahannam will ask, did you not receive a warning? Did not a warner come to you? And they say, قَالُوا بَلَى Yes, indeed, they did come. قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ Now imagine, they could have just said yes, indeed, and that would have been enough. قَالُوا بَلَى But the ad, قَدْ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبْنَا وَقُلْنَا مَا نَزَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِنْ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا فِي ضَلَالٍ كَبِيرٍ Yes, there came a warner to us, but we denied and said, Oh, this Allah thing that you're saying, Allah revealed nothing, you're making it up, you're extremely astray. And then they add, وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُوا مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ If only we actually listened and reasoned, we would not be among the residents of the blaze. فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسُحْقًا لِأَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ And so they confess their sins and away with them and the residents of the blaze, they go. Now what, is this, what does this mean? It means that every single person you know, Ibn Ashur writes beautifully here. Every single person, group, individual, collective, population that goes into Jahannam knows deep inside the truth. No one is going to be thrown into Jahannam out of confusion, out of misunderstanding, out of ignorance about reality. That Allah would have sent to that person a warner of some kind. Whether it's a friend, an ayah that appeared, a message of some kind. A sign that at least places in them this thought, this could be it. I should explore. There might be something here. But at some moment they choose, either choose to pay attention to it or choose not to. But deep inside each and every one of those who are thrown into Jahannam, they will admit that yes, a warning did come, but I denied, I disbelieved, and I decided to focus and distract myself with something else. Now what does that mean for those who, because remember the Prophet ﷺ, he says in the hadith, which is authentic, that there are groups of people which were not going to go to Jahannam, and they don't go to Jannah either.
but they get a specific test in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and deciding their uh, deciding their uh, their fate that test would basically do that uh, who are those people and Nabi sallam gives the example of someone who is basically um, who was who had some form of cognitive inability if we use that word loosely right they could not basically think or they didn't have the capacity to think and understand so when the messenger came they could not really connect with the message so Allah gives them a specific test exclusive to them on Yawm Al Qiyamah. The person was deaf, blind, mute, had no chance of connecting to the message. Allah gives them a specific test and the hadith is authentic. The other group is the group, the group that was in between prophets and messengers. So they received a message but it was so tainted that nobody would have believed in it. Like imagine between like after Prophet Musa for a long time before Isa comes. Or after Isa for a long time, right before the Prophet ﷺ comes. Where you're growing up in a, in a society where there are no, like no remnants. You're living in the forest. There is no message or access to that message. is so tainted that it's almost impossible to determine or to decide or decipher between what is good and what's acceptable and what's not. It's all like mushy, mushy and it's a lot of confusion and, and myth and, 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 and dehumanization of the people. Or misuse of information, misuse of role. Uh, role, uh, role models or misuse of power by role models. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a specific test. And they're known as Ahlil Fatra, the people of the period, meaning they come in a period between prophets and messengers or a period in time or a period in space, like a physical space in which access to knowledge almost did not exist. Did not exist. Now the question is, in the world that we're living in today, can you consider this to be a world where you have Ahl al fatra because information about Islam is so misrepresented, it's so bad, you turn Fox News on, you do this, you do that, uh, there's no way of attaining information. Because guys, we can only judge each phase. Like, Don't think about the phase before and the phase before. Allah sends His ways. Allah sends His messengers. We can look at this phase we're living in because, hey, we, we connect, we understand what's going on. Could you make an argument that in this world, nobody knows about Islam? A lot of people have received horrible information about Islam. But are there places where you can learn about Islam? There's, how many masajid exist in Canada? How many masajid exist in the States? How many masajid exist in these communities? Fine, there are no masajid. Okay, no masajid. How many Muslims exist? Muslims are what? Like, uh, yani we make a, at least a, a third, a third, right, of the world. A, a quarter of the world. Too many, right? Two, two billion, you mean? Yeah, two billion, right? So lots of Muslims, fine. But I live in a place where there are no Muslims. Just go on Instagram. Go on Facebook. Go on TikTok. And maybe not TikTok. Yani, may Allah guide, right? The halal side of TikTok. Yani. I remember back when Instagram would be like, Astaghfirullah, Instagram. Now TikTok is like, La hawla wa la quwata illa Right? Allah al-Musta'an. Again, all of these are tools that can be used good if the person has good in them. And they can be distracted like anything else, right? So, you, you can make a case, but it's a very, very weak case. It's a very weak case. And just like now, subhanAllah, there is a means for almost every individual, if they're honest, to look for truth and to explore truth, especially with what's happening in Gaza now, what's happening in Palestine. Like, it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests every generation with a calamity of some kind that makes it incumbent upon that generation to look, to ask, to search. Right? Regardless of where they are in the world, Allah has taken it upon Himself to give evidence and signs. We will show them signs around them, in the universe, and within them. Your own personal life. There will be times in which you're broken, you're humiliated, you're left vulnerable. And you have no choice but to say, hey, there's got to be something to this. There's got to be something more. There's got to be someone else. And the question is, when that happens, do you explore that or do you shut it down? That's evidence. Your own internal thoughts, your own lived experience becomes evidence against you. Your own mental experience, your own physical experience becomes an evidence against you and the universal signs. Like I'm sure, you know, even the biggest atheist, the biggest atheist, the one who denies and this and this and that. I'm sure there's going to be at least one or two or three moments in their life 
that they feel something. They feel something. You know, when you, when you hold your child for the first time, and they look at you and they smile, the first time your child opens up their eyes or, you know, says Baba or Mama for the first time, that does something to you. That love, right? That love. Or it could be, subhanAllah, when you're on your deathbed. It could be when you lose a loved one. There's got to be something that goes on in a sickness of some kind that really leaves you a humiliation of some kind, a blessing. But something, sometime, somewhere, in some space, will force you to look within you and to look around you and ask, what is, who is, why is this going on? Who is allowing for this to happen? Where does this love come from? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, each and every person and group that enters Jahannam will eventually confess to their sins. So what a terrible punishment for the people of the flame. Now why is this important? Because this complements the ayat that we hear. Allah will not be oppressive towards any any individual. Allah is not going to be oppressive to any group. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ فَتِيلَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ Right? نَقِيرَ فَتِيلَ You know the, subhanAllah, you know a date? The date? You open the date, what's inside the date? The seed or the pit. Right? So you take the seed. You know that layer? You know that little layer that, that wraps the seed up? Allah says you will not be oppressed even to the extent of that layer. You will not be wrong even to the extent of that layer. Naqira. Now, you know in the date, in the date, when you open the seed, but you take the, that little layer out. You know there's a small little layer that is basically in between. You know how the date has that little crevice? In that crevice, there's a small little uh, fiber that you can peel out. It's even more fragile. Allah says in the Quran two times, you would not be oppressed to the extent of that little fibrous line or the extent of that transparent cover. Can you imagine the justice of Allah that none of you are going to experience in standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala injustice even to that magnitude. The next time you open a date, you eat a date, open up that little fatila, that little naqira, Open it, wrap it up, feel its weight. Feel how small and seemingly insignificant it is and know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's justice would not allow even that slight injustice or weight of injustice to take place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be from those who follow him, implement what he teaches, Ya Rabb Ameen, what the Quran teaches and allow us to be from those people of clarity, Ya Rabb Ameen. جزاكم الله خير سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك and we'll see you next week inshallah wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh well by the way last week i did promise if anybody has questions that they would like to ask publicly we can do a 5 minute q and a inshallah so if anybody has any questions we can do a 5 minute q and a yes Yeah. 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 So the the scholars, the scholars of tafsir, they say that all of these ayat which refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the like the 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 leg or the sh the shin of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Nothing is like Allah. Laysa kamithli shay. So nothing is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't imagine a human hand. Don't imagine this. Don't imagine that. Right? And at the same time, whatever Allah attributes to himself, we understand to be attributed to him. Tamam? So some, some scholars and early, even early scholars understand that to be metaphorical. Like the hand of Allah, meaning the power of Allah, meaning the capacity of Allah, the dominion of Allah. And others, they say it is some form of entity that belongs to Allah that we cannot imagine, beyond their imagination. Amen? 
So it's not, it should not be imagined. It should not be limited to a physical space and place, right? But others have said that it is beyond the imagination and others interpret it to be metaphorical. Both are acceptable positions. Beyond the imagination to Allah, whatever He wills and attributes to Himself or metaphorically interpreted to mean something that is more within our imagination. So do you see what's... Like one is trying to make it closer to the imagination by saying it's metaphorical. And others saying it is what it is, but it's just beyond the imagination. Don't delve into it. You see, the debate is actually very simple. It's not, it's not a war. They're both getting to the same point, which is Allah is beyond the limitations of the mind. Does that make sense? Barakallah. Uh, I'm not sure who's... I think your hand and then your hand. And then your hand. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the sister is asking for those people who don't know much about Islam except the five pillars And they don't have access uh, Or they might have access but they just don't know Everybody has access but they might not know Would they fall into those things? Look, would they fall into the category of those who would be basically be considered Ahl al-Fatr? Somebody who has access to knowledge is not considered to be from Ahl al-Fatr As long as you have access to knowledge you cannot use that as an excuse. It becomes important on that person to learn. But ultimately, we as Muslims, we make categorical judgments. The person who does not do this and this and that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may punish them. But we don't make individual judgments. We don't say Abdullah is going to be punished. Muhammad is in Jahannam. Because we don't know. Allah knows what's internal to them, what's external to them, the limitations. So we make, we make again, um, statements based on categories, categorical statements, not subjective or individual statements or judgments. Does that make sense? So don't use the whole don't judge me, don't judge me approach because there are certain patterns. Once you manifest, yeah, there's a judgment to be passed, right? But at the same time, we don't judge. We don't judge because it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge. Do you see the difference? So we don't use it as an excuse. Like, oh, don't judge me, don't judge me. I can do whatever I want. And only Allah judge. No, like, there are patterns. Be careful. Advice, advice is a brother, a sister. But at the same time, we don't pass judgments on individuals. Categorical only. Right? So Allah knows what happens with them, but we advise them to learn and we try to create the spaces for them to, to be able to uh, learn. You know, Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali, the famous Muhammad al-Ghazali in Egypt, they asked him, what's the ruling on someone who doesn't pray? He said, the ruling is you take him with you to the masjid. Do you see the answer? Because usually... What do you expect the person to say? The ruling on someone who doesn't pray? Jahannam. Kafir. But he's avoiding that. He's avoiding. He's like, you know what? The, the, the ruling is you try to take them with you to the masjid. You try to make the masjid welcoming for them. Does that make sense? So try to create the same, same question. Try to create the space for that person to get closer to Allah and, uh, and the welcoming environment for that person to be excited to connect with Allah. To the best of your capacity. Knowing that you cannot guide, Allah is the ultimate guide. I believe it was Ali and then the sister, inshallah. Ali? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So Ali's question is very interesting. He says, Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَ بِي أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ Right? Uh, and there are many times in the Quran where Allah says, don't look, don't look too much at the material desires of this dunya. The things that will cause you to be distracted by seeking that which is not important. Right? Now, you see a nice car. Let's give a very practical example. You see a nice car and you look and you keep looking and looking and looking and looking, if that look is causing a distraction, meaning, I really want the car for the car, I really want the car for the car, I really want the car for the car, and it becomes like you know, consuming in that way, look away. 
But if you're looking at a nice car, and that nice car makes you think, subhanAllah, how Allah gave the human being the capacity to invent, you know, mashallah, the aerodynamic nature of the, you know, whatever, you know, that's, that's very, very much beautiful. And it's, you're, you're seeing as a way of connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You say to yourself, it would be nice to drive a car like this, maybe to kind of like make a statement of power on behalf of Muslims and on behalf of Islam. Like there are communities, by the way, once you drive in with a specific car, you're treated very differently. In my books, I don't care. I could not care less what car you drive. It does not really matter to me personally. It doesn't matter. That's not the way we pass judgment. That's not the way we, we evaluate things. But in a community that does, and you walk or you drive in a car like that, the ma'am, and you make a statement of power and a statement of, it, it, has, it has its place. So if you're able to use, again, it all depends on the intentionality and the mind and the thought. So for someone who's chasing the dunya, and they're chasing the dunya or something in the dunya because they really want to speak to a specific people and to show them, hey, it doesn't matter much. I have much more than you, and I'm not distracted by it. I'm still able to use it to connect with something bigger, something greater. It signifies my connection to Allah. That's okay. That's a form of also da'wah. But sometimes people use that as an excuse. Why are you, oh, Shaykh, I want to drive the Ferrari because I want to do da'wah, mashallah. Tayyip, and uh, Habibi, now you have the Ferrari. Why, why do you have uh, Sally here and Melissa in the back and music? It's like, you know, Shaykh, this is also a form of da'wah. you know. But it depends on the intentionality and what happens when you actually get it. As long as you're not deceiving yourself. Yeah, and you have to be honest, right? You have to be honest. Uh, I believe it was the sister Tadali. Yeah, so some of the shooting stars, uh, whether it was at the time of the Prophet or now, uh, there's difference of opinion, but some of those shooting stars would be, yes, would be perceived as that. Yeah. Yes? Allah is the one who decides how much access someone had and how little access qualifies someone to specific exemptions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Because only He can make a, a judgment based on our limitations, on our capacities and our incapacities. We can't. Because sometimes someone can appear like they don't know, but they might have access in ways that you don't know, right? Allah can manifest in many, many ways. Uh, dreams as a form of revelation or as a form of enlightenment or inspiration. It's very possible, Right? Allah can inspire you in many, many ways. You look at someone who's living. Let me give you an example. You look at someone who's living in the middle of the forest. Who never had access to YouTube, videos, anything, nothing. They've never seen a Muslim. You would think that person, that person is going to Jannah because they don't know anything about Islam. What if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed that person in a dream? Islam is the way Muhammad is your prophet. Go to this specific place and learn from the specific person. What if they saw that dream 500 times and they never told you? You just don't know. You don't know how that person was inspired, how Allah communicates with the individual. That's why we say, leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and try to increase access whenever possible. Uh, I think it was, yes, totally, and then yes. Okay, good. So, um, Ruqya, Ruqya means what? Ruqya means spiritual healing. Ruqya means spiritual healing. The Prophet wasallam, in a story where the companions went to a place, the people refused to give them anything, they were not hospitable, then one of them was very sick, nothing was working, so they came to them and said, hey, can you help us? One of the companions said, yes, I'll help you, let me read some Quran on you, and he recited Surah Al-Fatiha, and that person got better, came back to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, this is what I did. I recited Fatiha on somebody, they got better. The Prophet ﷺ says, how did you know it was Ruqya? How did you know it was Ruqya? So Ruqya is acceptable. Ruqya is acceptable. To go and get Ruqya in a time where you're really desperate and you don't know how to do it yourself is acceptable. To, be, to pay somebody is acceptable. It's fine. But to make it a business transaction where it lacks that spiritual connection, like the payment should be kind of like, 
as a as a given on the side, not the intention, not the focus. And the payment is not for the service, it's for the time. So I'm paying you for your time. You took some time to sit with me, it's hapsil waqt. So I'm paying for your time. But there's no payment for the service of delivering the ruqya. Do you see the difference? It's hapsil waqt, it's for the time. But at the same time, there's a hadith in which the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, from the 70,000 who are going to enter Jannah without any prior punishment or account, one of those things is that that person never turned to somebody for ruqya. They try to engage and try to heal themselves by themselves and by connecting and relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now that can apply, but if somebody's desperate, it's completely fine. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Tadari uh, What is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. So the sister, the sister's question was, if somebody only knows the five pillars of Islam and they don't know more, more than that, um, and, and because they don't know more than that, they fall into a lot of ignorance. That was the assumption. They fall into a lot of ignorance and they don't know. So may Allah protect. But you're right. Knowing the five pillars of Islam, in many, many ways, it is, is, and working on that, it will create everything else you need, inshallah, to make it to Jannah. But let's say, for example, somebody doesn't know, or yani, based on the five pillars, the five pillars don't include cheating, lying, being good to parents. So you can still do the five pillars. You can pray, you can fast, you can go for hajj while you're oppressing your mom, you're beating your children, you're cheating on your wife, on your husband, you're manipulating wealth. You're, you know, so there's the, you can't reduce Islam to just the five pillars. The five pillars, just like they are, look at the pillars of the masjid. They're pillars. They keep the structure standing. But the structure is much greater than that. So for the person, they say, oh, bro, oh, don't tell me about the fact that I sell alcohol and I, say, oh, and I have a, a drug dealing business. Bro, I do the five pillars, man. I'm the biggest donator in Ramadan. That's not Islam. It's not just the five pillars. But the idea is if you're committed to Islam genuinely, the five pillars will create and lead to everything else. They'll allow everything else to build. But you need to be actively building that too. Okay? Uh, yes. Sorry? Uh, I have five. Elaborating on I have five. The missiles. How does that work? So the Shalteen used to go up and they used to try to listen in on what the angels are saying is going to happen. What Allah is commanding the angels to do. Try, you know, try to basically collect the information and come down and use the information for their own good. And then Allah sent the stars to kind of like shoot them down so they could no longer do that. It's a mechanical thing, yeah. It's a mechanical thing they have. It's through the will of Allah, yes. Yeah. But it can be through the will, of, like it's all through the will of Allah. Like, let me give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made two angels, one rights and one witnesses. It's mechanical. One is writing. You understand? One is writing. Allah could have just made it automate, like, you know, it doesn't have to be mechanical. But for some wisdom known to him, he's made it mechanical. So some, some, th some things he's automated through some form of mechanism. Right? Imagine the way the earth gives rise to seeds. It's mechanical. It's a mechanism. It's a process. But that process itself is a manifestation of the qadr of Allah, the will of Allah. Does that make sense? You can ask a follow-up if you want. Okay.
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Allah alam. Allah alam. We 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 don't have right. There's some things beyond the capacity of Mahjah. Hassan, طيب. I think there was a question. I don't know if it was. Yeah, فضلي. Go ahead. Yeah, um, good question. So, inshallah, let's take maybe two more and then after that, let's wrap it up because of time. So, sister asked if I used to before praying um, or after praying, now that I'm praying, or other some other person, now that they're praying, they are engaging in more sinful behavior of some kind. And the question is, why am I praying? How does that work? Look, when you're very far away from Allah, the shayateen, they're not bothered by you because you're on self-destruction mode. You're doing, you're doing it to yourself when you're far away from Allah. Like whatever, it doesn't, you're, you're good. But once you start committing to Allah, they get very agitated. So that's when there's a lot of pressure to start whispering, do this, 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 do this. And that in itself is actually part of the purification process. Because once you pray, you're closer to Allah, you get tested more. When Allah brings, how, how do you get better? Imagine you go to the gym and you're working out. How do you get better? More weights, increase the weight. So Allah increases the pressure so that you actually end up praying more. And you build the tolerance. And as you engage in that constant, the whispers may get louder and louder and louder, but eventually you become so strong that they're shut off immediately. And you, become, you begin to be tested in other areas. That's how you're elevated. Allah gives you harder tests that you have to overcome as part of the process. That actually means it's working. That means it's actually very much working. So shaitan will actually now try to win by saying, look, you're praying, but my voices, my whispers have only become louder. You're sinning more. So why even praying? It's not working for you. You got to try something else. Don't pray at all. See, but you're like, no, guess what? I'm going to continue praying and praying and praying. So that is actually shaitan's last attempt desperate attempt to try to you know bring you back by saying it's not working prayer is not working go back but you say no i'm going to continue to pray 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 actually pray more the more you tell me it's not working i actually add the sunnah and the nawafil and this and this and that and now you end up like mashallah tabarakallah reaching a level where you would not have reached it had there not been pressure to fight so allah has allowed that pressure to exist so it becomes a reason for you to actually overcome does that make sense and Allah bless you. You're welcome. So let's take the brother, yeah. Ahl al -fatra. So Ahl al -fatra, there's one example test where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will um, allow something to manifest and pretend to be Allah that it's not. And then he will manifest and they will know him. And then he will ask them to do something that might be difficult to do, but because they've known him, they're, they're, they should be able to do it. So that's an example of a test. Good. Okay. Question from the sisters? Did you already ask one? Yeah, let's give somebody else a chance. Hafsa. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere, inshallah. Missiles, yeah. No, 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 no. It's not that there were no shooting stars. It's that there were no shooting stars aimed at the shayateen. But exactly, yeah. Shooting stars existed before and existed after. It's just that now they're used, they're basically aiming specifically for the, some of them are aimed for the shayateen.
there's a difference of opinion. But the majority say that some say it was only during the time of the Prophet. ﷺ. It may have opened up afterwards. Majority position is that it stopped completely after the Prophet. ﷺ. Perfect. Let's take the brother and then come back to the sister's question. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He will show you signs not just once or twice or three times. It will become very clear. And it's just not just a five-minute conversation once and another. It'll be enough that it's, it shows you His mercy and rahmah. It'll be enough. It'll be enough times. It'll be enough for that person to begin to ask questions. Yes. Can't, can't hear you. Sorry. Say that again. Yeah. Live, my advice is live a life of wara and taqwa. Wara and taqwa is where you begin to leave the gray for the sake of the clear. Especially if you're trying to live an ethical life. So let's say there is a matter in which, let's say, for example, mortgage. Mortgages, there may be opinions. Consensus, like the, the European Fiqh Council, and this uh, council here and that council, it's okay in a minority context, in a North American context, to buy your first home on mortgage. But you realize the evidence for that and the justification for that is kind of, you know, okay, if somebody, but I won't take it, I'll take a more caution, cautionary opinion. That is wara. You don't take the extreme opinion, you take the, more, the opinion that has the stronger evidence. And the less room for error. That's a life of wara. But when there's two things that have equal evidence, you take the easier one. Let me give you an example. The Prophet ﷺ, he says in the Quran, if you're traveling, you should break your fast. You see how it's actually, again, easier, but the evidence is clear. So when the Prophet ﷺ was given a choice between two things that had equal evidence, he would take the easier of them. But when he was given two choices, and one had better evidence, and was even a, a bit more difficult, he would take that. That's wara. So take the license when the license is clear, adopt the position of wara when the evidence for the opposite is hazy or unclear. You do that, you'll live a life, inshaAllah, that will bring you to levels with Allah that others are not going to be able to attain. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. You ask the people, that, you know, we're talking to te teachers, asking teachers, ask them when you ask the question, what's the position of wara? You ask them that. What's the, what's the, pre what's the cautionary position? And they'll tell you. And this is pretty much like a consensus. Just a lot of people, when you come to them and you ask them for a ruhsa, they'll give you the license because they want to make your life easy. But when you tell them, look, I'm trying to live a life of a specific kind, they'll give you the answer that, you're, that will uphold you to the best of integrity, inshallah. Right? Again, and all of those, again, all of those are valid opinions. Just to make it very clear, if somebody's going to take the opinion of mortgage, no problem. It's a valid fatwa. Right? But if somebody wants to take a more cautionary opinion, may Allah bless them. That's closer to taqwa, and Allah knows best. Yes.
Yeah. Look, um, sometimes something appears to be spiritually good or neutral, but it's zero spirituality. It's zero spirituality. It's a feeling, a false feeling of spirituality, but it's not real. It's an illusion. So the person himself or herself might think that what they're seeing is real, but it's not connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they might be invoking the Quran or this or this or that, but there might be some, if it's, if it's bad, there's always going to be a hint of evil there. So the Quran will flip the ayah upside down or add a little bit of blood here or do a little bit of sacrifice. There's always going to be something. You just don't know it. It might be just between them, right? And for some people, subhanAllah, it might just be Allah Ana, maybe their own whispers, their own desires, their own you know, thoughts. It could be like a mental health disorder for that person. Allah Alam, Allah Alam, what it is, right? I can't really specifically tell you. But what is from the Sunnah? What is from the Sunnah? Is yes, you can use zamzam water, yes, you can use honey, you can use black seed, all of these prophetic medicine things you can use. You can read Quran on water and drink it, you can read Quran on you know uh, something as before you eat it. All of these things are acceptable, all of that is acceptable. So, if someone is healing you in forms of acceptability, that is fine. But the minute they say, I know the future, I know this, this person is telling me this, that all of that is ghaib, it's part of the ghaib. So I would shy away from that kind of thing and opening the door for that. Because even if it's within some form of like, look, uh, just be very very specific, yani, there may be some people, like the Prophet wasallam says, dreams will continue to be a small portion of inspiration. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire people to see things through the dreams that might come in the future. Allah might give someone a gift where they might have some form of pre about something that's going to happen. Allah might give them the ability to understand some things here and there, to see, to foresee things. Allah gives these, yeah, Allah gives it to them. It's a gift that Allah gives, and it's there in the tradition. But how they use that, how you attribute power, what you, how you make sense of it, you say, oh, Allah has given that person a gift. They should use it for good, not misuse it. That's beyond that. Anything beyond that, oh, this person knows. No, no, no. It's very limited within a very specific context. Does that make sense? It's a full organization. I, I can't, Allah Alam, I, I don't know. I guess once it's a full organization, it becomes problematic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Allah. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's fine before. Yani, khair, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah, most likely. Most likely. It's just based on guesswork. Yeah. Okay, good question, by the way. So the brother said, if the door to getting information from the heavens is shut, you take that opinion. How come sometimes when you go to a psychic, they might give you very, very intimate information about yourself? This is actually very easy to answer. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that each and every individual has a qareen. Right? In Surah al zukhruf Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that each and every person has a qareen. That qareen is a sign for you to kind of like their job, just like you have eight, seven angels, nine angels, one is writing, one is encouraging, one is uh, making dua, one is sending salawat upon the Prophet. So many different angels protecting you. There's one qareen whose job is to make, create a profile of your weaknesses, your limitations, your vulnerabilities. And to start picking the right time and the right place to whisper. Oh, his weakness is like right after a bad exam. He's in this really bad mental space where if you really send this specific individual with this specific substance, halas, wild nonsense is going to happen. So that information is available to the shayateen. So somebody who's like a psychic who's dealing with that world somehow, they get access to some of the information. There's some form of transaction. You do this to me, I do this to you. 
And then they use that information then to give to the psychic. And the psychic is like, oh, do you know that? Remember, uh, hmm? do you remember this? Or remember that? It's just based on that information from the Qareem. It doesn't have to be coming from the heavens. It's just the Qareem. Wallahu a'lam. Yeah, it's all part of the ghaib. Yes. Because it comes from an evil source. And it's used for evil. 